So praise the Lord. All right, uh, today, I'm just going to tell you in advance, I love this message. And I, I didn't even realize at the beginning of this week I was going to be preaching on this. They've been going through uh, Hebrews 11, uh, the faithful. And uh, after Joseph, we spent three weeks talking about Joseph. And so I knew the next one was Moses. But actually, before we get to Moses, we get to Moses' parents. And that's Hebrews 11, 23. And uh, I'll tell you, I got so blessed. This is one of my, I, this might be one of my favorite messages, and I haven't even preached it yet. Uh, but the story of a parent's faith, of Moses' parents. And probably most of us, I don't know if you've ever heard a message uh, preached on Moses' parents. Uh, uh, but anyhow, you're going to hear one today. And uh, it's an amazing story, and it really fits in. Uh, to that idea of the fullness of time, of how God works all things uh, according to his riches in glory. And so we're going to look at, first of all, the fullness, that Moses' parents, they were not afraid of Pharaoh's edict. You see, there is a legacy that we leave for our family and for generations to come. In God's economy, there is a fullness of time in our lives as God is working out every detail in our life and for the world. And even though we may not have a clue that it's happening, we see his unseen hand working in our circumstances. So letter A, we're going to look at Moses' parents were not afraid of Pharaoh's edict. And this is simply what it says in Hebrews 11:23. It says, "By faith, Moses' parents hid him for 3 months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict." So, in one of the most life-changing decisions came at the birth of a child. Now just kind of set this up for you if you're not real familiar with the story. Uh, Israel had been in Egypt for 400 years. Uh, they were put under slavery and oppression. And in order to keep population control, uh, the king made an edict and he had every baby boy that was born in Israel thrown into the Nile River. The girls could live, but the boys were thrown into the river. So Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, uh, this is really cool. It says that they saw that their child was no ordinary child. I mean, what parent ever thinks that, the, boy, that's an ordinary baby we had? We had four babies. We never thought, man, that is pretty ordinary. Did you all have an ordinary baby? No. no. Our babies are the most beautiful babies that you've ever seen. And, uh, of course, they're precious to us. And I really believe that what God is saying is that their hearts were so troubled and moved, kind of like uh, Laura, that they just could not, could not allow this baby to be thrown into the Nile River. They were going to do whatever they could possibly do, and so they decided against all odds, against the will of the government, against the will of Pharaoh, that they were going to defy his decree, facing the penalty of death. They could not, they would not kill their baby boy. Somehow they would protect him. Now, we know in hindsight that this single decision, you know what it did? It changed the course of history. It literally changed the course of history. Without this decision, we would not have had the Mosaic Law. We would not have had the Ten Commandments. Think about the ripple effects, the repercussions that have changed history. 
All of Western civilization is built on Judeo-Christian values that come from the Old and New Testament. All of this was in uh, effect when Moses may have been thrown into uh, the Nile River. The deliverance of Israel was hanging in the balance. Now, there are two things, two key phrases in Hebrews 11.23 that I want us to look at. The first one is the first two words, by faith, and the second one is they were not afraid. By faith and not afraid. I believe that those two phrases, states of being that motivates every decision that we make. Do you realize that? You're either making a decision by faith or you're making decisions out of fear. You're, it's something that causes you to be fearful. Man, it's fight, uh, flight, and you just kind of uh, get overwhelmed by the situation, or you're going to walk by faith. Fear is the atmosphere that faith pushes back on. Hey, if there's going to be a move of faith in your life, that means that there is blowback coming against you. There is darkness all around. If there's no problems, there's no situations that you're going through, you do not need the faith to be able to walk into it. So faith comes, it's like light surrounded by darkness, surrounded by tribulation around us that we walk in by faith. There was a sense of dread in the hearts of the Hebrew women who were pregnant. Now, I'm sure that they were probably praying, God, please give us a girl. They're carrying these babies, and if the baby comes out to be a boy, it was going to be taken from them and thrown into the river, and they just wished, God, give us a girl so that we do not have to lose this child that you have given to us. There were probably Egyptian soldiers patrolling uh, watching, getting ready for the deliveries, and making that decision. Now, faith believes in God. Faith trusts in God. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things that we have not yet seen. And so they had to, by faith, Make this decision. Faith will fly in the face of conventional wisdom. If you are going to move mountains, change the atmosphere, it's not going to happen with conventional wisdom. Or in other words, human reasoning. You're not going to be able to reason it out in your mind in order to get to the other side. You're going to have to take a step of faith. Your belief in God, trusting in Him, trusting in His Word. You see, faith and fear cannot coexist together. Either you're walking in faith or you're walking in fear. One or the other is going to dominate your life. Let me give you an illustration, uh, one that you're really familiar with, but it really touches on this point of walking in faith or walking by fear. And that's the account in Matthew 14 of Jesus walking on water. And it tells us, starting in verse 25, it said, uh, During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. How many of you are in the midst of a circumstance where you're just overwhelmed by fear? 
Do you hear the voice of Jesus saying to you, Take courage, it is I, I'm with you, do not be afraid. And so Peter said, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. He is going to test the faith that he has in God. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. So far, so good. Now let me ask you a question. I thought about that this week. Why not? There's 12 of them. They've all been there with Jesus. They see Jesus walking on the water. Now they see Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water. How many of you, one time in your life, would literally like to get out of the boat and walk on water? Amen? So why didn't any of the other 11 ask Jesus, Hey, can we walk on the water with you? The reason is, I believe, because they were gripped with fear. They were still more fearful, even though they saw Jesus on the water, even though they saw Peter walking on the water. Sometimes we can just sit in the pew of our faith, gripped with fear. We hear the testimonies, we read the word, but we're really not walking in faith. We're letting the fear overwhelm us. And the fact is, not one of those disciples, hey, James and John, the sons of thunder, if they said, hey, we want to get out there, they jump out of the boat, you know what happened? They would have sank to the bottom because Jesus did not tell anyone but Peter that he could walk on the water. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. Peter asked, and Jesus gave him the word of faith. He said, come. So he gets out of the boat and lo and behold, he too is walking on the water. But, but, there's always a but when we're walking by faith. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. How long did it take his faith to disappear, dissipate, and turn into fear it only takes a nanosecond. You can't have them both existing at the same time. As soon as he took his eyes off Jesus and he looked at the wind, his natural, rational mind kicked in and said, hey, I've been fishing my whole life. You can't walk on the water. Fear got into his heart and he began to sink. And it says, immediately... Uh, he said, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Hey, Peter had little faith. The other guys in the boat had no faith. But at least he had the faith to step out and to try and to move. So it is that faith and that fear that we constantly battle against. At some point, we can't give up to the fear of the enemy. Do you hear me? That fear that wants to get on the inside, you cannot allow that fear to get in. The fear of the world, even if it's going to cost us personally. Amram and Jochebed were not afraid because they were moving and walking by faith. That's what the Bible says. By faith, they hit him, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Why? Uh, what, the, what they didn't realize was how this, cha uh, this decision would be so life-changing. Let's look at letter B here. God's timing in our circumstances. You say, God's never late, but he's seldom early. He's always right on time. Amen? Do you get a witness to that? Has that been true in your life? I mean, right at 11.59 that he comes through. Well, everything, letter B, works in the fullness of time. That's what it tells us in Galatians 4.4. 4. In the fullness of time, God sent his Son. So let's look at the timing of God. Everything that God does has a precision to it. So it is so perfect 
that it boggles the mind when we get a glimpse of it. It may not look, it may look like chaos on the outside, but on the inside there is a precision of God working in the situation. You know, that whole perfect timing for Ken and Laura. Uh, the day that they're leaving, and this place had just opened up a few weeks earlier. It wasn't going to work a month earlier. May not have worked. Well, the guy was getting ready to retire the next week. So the timing had to be perfect. I want to tell you God's timing in your life will be perfect if we walk with him. Amen? Hey, same thing when we found the community center. We were praying the whole summer, but the timing wasn't right. We came in three weeks after it had opened, and we showed up, and uh, the lady at the front opened up the dead uh, registers uh, thing, and she had a little yellow sticky, hold for church, and uh, we said, hey, we just walked in, but God's timing, it is always perfect in our lives. When did Jesus come to earth? The Bible tells us in the fullness of time God sent his son. When is Jesus going to return? He's going to return in the fullness of time. We can see all the signs of his coming around the world. And at the perfect time, God will come back. Christ will come back for his church. So in one sense, God is the greatest mathematician in the universe. And what looks like chaos in the world is a precision. What may look like chaos in your life on the outside, God is working all things together for good. There is a perfect timing. Not only was Jesus born in the fullness of time, now this is interesting, the prophet Daniel... In Daniel chapter 9, we'll go into the weeds on this one, but he predicted the very day that Christ would come and atone for our sins. And in chapter 9, he talks about the 77s and the 69 sevens, and it says in Daniel 9, 27, after the 62 sevens, that turned out to be 434 years, the anointed one, Jesus will be cut off, referring to his death on the cross. Now, we know the exact timing of this prophecy because it tells us at the beginning of that chapter, in the first year of King Darius. And so, Bible scholars take, they know the year of King Darius, his first year of his reign, and they move forward 432 years, 34 years, and they land in 33 A.D. What happened in 33 A.D.? That year Jesus died on the cross. The timing was absolutely perfect by God. He even gave the dates for Christ's death. So we fast forward 400 years when Israel has been in Egypt, enslaved and mistreated in Egypt, till the final straw when Pharaoh gives the edict to kill all the baby boys. What happened shortly? Now that, by the way, when was this edict given? It was given shortly before the birth of Moses. This had not been going on for 30, 40, 50 years. This had just started shortly before. How do we know that? Well, Moses had an older brother. His name was Aaron. Aaron was three years old when Moses was born. So that means from the time that Moses was born, three years passed, somewhere in that time, the king finally gave the edict to kill all the baby boys. I want you to know, this was not by accident. This was spiritual warfare that was going on. Do you understand what's going on behind the scenes? What the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and principalities. Hey, uh, Satan knew the timing of when Moses would come. How did he know? Because God told Abraham in Genesis 
15, he said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Now, Satan can do math just as well as anyone else. So he goes 400 years in advance. That time is near. And I'm telling you, Satan got into the heart and mind of Pharaoh and said, you got to do something about this population here. You need to get these boys and you need to throw them into the Nile. There was something spiritual going on behind the scenes that was taking place that nobody could see with their physical eyes. Amen? So that's why he gives this decree, and he's going to try and snuff out God's plan for Moses by a shotgun approach. Now that sounds familiar. When did that happen again in the Bible? Happened when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and King Herod, right on time, he's trying it again with a shotgun approach to kill all the baby boys two years and younger in Bethlehem and its vicinity trying to wipe out Jesus before he's born. I want to tell you there is spiritual warfare that's going on in the nations. It's going on in our lives that we need to be a people of prayer. We need to be a people that prays for our nations, for our leaders. By the way, I heard this this past week. Now, would it bother you if you knew that over two or three hundred witches on October 35th are going to be praying and casting spells on the President of the United States. 31st. October 31st. Uh, uh, did I say 35th? Okay, well, I'm sorry. I usually don't listen to what I'm saying. I'm glad you are. So on October 31st, uh, but imagine that. I mean, you may not like the president, but could you imagine that all the things that are going on, that's why the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders, pray for those who are in authority over us. There is spiritual warfare going on. And so there is always this warfare, and we see it with the story of Moses. We saw it with the story of, um, of Jesus how the enemy is trying to work in our midst. Now, if he can do this, what the devil means for evil, God will work out for good. If he can do it for Ken and Laura, if he can do it for our church, if he can do it for Moses and do it for Jesus, he will do it for you. Amen? Amen. Hey, the job that you've been praying for, the house that you've been looking for, the spouse that you have been waiting for, hey, may not have arrived yet. The Bible tells us when the vision tarries, wait on it, for it will surely come. You just hang in there. You keep praying by faith. You keep holding on. And I want to tell you, you are going to be so glad on the day that God delivers in the fullness of time. It's always darkest just before the dawn. But it will happen in the fullness of God's time. Do you believe that? Amen? God is going to do it in his time. So let's look at the fulfillment here. Uh, number two, let's get into the details, into the weeds of the fulfillment of God's plan. So they make the decision, Jochebed and uh, Amram, to hide the baby. And they're asking themselves, now what? If you want to turn in the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, we'll look at this account in Exodus chapter 2. And uh, we'll see that Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses in the Nile. Let me start in verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. 
But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Her sister, that was Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Okay, so the first step is what? The first step is faith. It is the decision that we make. Faith is a decision. The belief that they could not, would not kill the child. I don't know what we're going to do. I just know what we're not going to do. We're not going to let this child die if we can help it putting their lives on the line, risking their whole family. Now think about this. They had to go for three months hiding this baby boy. By the way, there is no other baby boys except for Moses during this time because all the rest of them have been thrown to the bottom of the Nile. He's the only one in Israel that's three months of age. And what's going to happen if the parents are found out, Jochebed and Amran are going to be killed, and that's going to leave their three-year-old son uh, without parents, their daughter, Miriam, who was probably 10 or 11 at the time, without parents. They had their whole family to think about. They were thinking, maybe we shouldn't do this. I mean, this is a battle that's going on. Faith is always a battle, especially with our human reasoning, thinking this doesn't make sense but they're going to do it anyway. Amen? It was a conviction. That decision is really conviction. Faith is the conviction of what you believe. So by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months. And I imagine there was all kinds of cloud, confusion, not sure what to do. I mean, every morning when they woke up, as they went through the dead, how are we going to get through this day with this baby and not be found out? Uh, this may have been the most anxious three months of their lives. Asking God, where are you? Help us. Hey, have you been there? Are you there right now? We go through all of these situations, and God will be with us. So Moses uh, was there for three months, and uh, there were probably more close calls with the Egyptian soldiers on the prowl than they would want to recount. Can you only imagine the suspense and the intense, uh, intensity of that three months with him? Do you remember how... Joseph and Mary, had they had those close calls when they gave birth to Jesus. In Matthew 2, it says this, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. That's kind of interesting. Uh, God's going to hide the baby Jesus in Egypt. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and escaped to Egypt. There was no time to waste. The enemy, Herod's soldiers, were hot on his trail, and if they didn't get up at that precise time, uh, the baby Jesus may have been found by the soldiers. And so they got up, and uh, finally, Aram and Jochebed made the gut-wrenching decision there's no way that they can hide this baby any longer, so they made an ark. You know, there may have been a really close call that came, and they said, we're just not going to be able to do this. And so they decide, uh, we'll try and uh, protect them some other way. Those, they placed the child and put him among the reeds, uh, reeds in the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. So she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. Then one of the Hebrew, uh, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said, 
Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Now, I want you to get and drink in this whole situation as it was unfolding for them. Who came? Pharaoh's daughter came. She had gotten up that morning, maybe gotten ready, had some breakfast, and she left the palace and showed up at the exact time that this basket was put in the reeds there by the Nile. This was not an accident. This was a divine appointment by God. Do you know how big, by the way, the Nile River is? The Nile River is 4,132 miles long. So if you ever happen to be on Jeopardy, remember that, because you might be asked. It's one of the largest rivers in the world. I mean, literally, if you want to know how long that river is, you got in your car and you drove all the way to California, and then you turned around and you came all the way back home, that's about how long the Nile River is. What are the odds that Pharaoh's daughter would be close enough? I mean, she couldn't have been a mile away, that would have been too far away. She couldn't have been a half mile away. She would have never seen the basket. She had to be literally a couple hundred yards away to be able to see the basket and to hear the baby crying. And that basket couldn't have been there too long because, you know, crocodiles or birds of the air, something would have came and eaten that child uh, while it was there in the basket. And so it's Pharaoh's daughter who comes. And by the way, is there anyone else that you could think of in Egypt that could have done what Pharaoh's daughter did? There is not one official in Egypt that was going to contradict the Pharaoh's edict and take that baby. There's not one slave person. There's nobody but Pharaoh's daughter is able to bend the rules. She is able to change the situation. And look at what else God did. God changed her heart. You know, the worst day, you know, think about that. What are the odds that she would come at that exact spot at that exact time for the baby? I want to tell you that the odds are very, very good when God is in it. What are the odds that God will show up at the exact time for you and your situation? The odds are very, very good when God is your Lord and He is in it. The worst day in Jochebed and Amram's life, when she put that basket into the reeds by the Nile, I want to tell you that was simply nothing less than an act of desperation. It's what we call the Hail Mary. You know what I'm saying? There's only one play that we can run. It's the Hail Mary. We're going to win or lose in this situation. So she puts the basket there by the reeds. And let me ask you, so Miriam's hanging around. so wanting to see what's going to happen to this baby. Why don't you think uh, Jochebed, Moses' mother, didn't hang around? I think emotionally she couldn't take it. She just couldn't imagine seeing what's going to happen to this child. Hanging on there for three months. She just had to go home. I want to tell you something that is absolutely incredible. It's the bitterness and the sweetness when they come together in one of the most incredible, miraculous ways. The Bible tells us in Psalms 30, Weeping may remain for a night, yes. but rejoicing comes in the morning. Amen? Amen? Hey, you hang in there. There's going to be rejoicing in the morning. When they do the Passover and they have the bitter herbs and they give that, it leaves this bitter taste in your mouth, but it's followed by the sweetness that comes and it takes all of the bitterness out of your mouth. 
And the only thing that's left is the sweetness because there's nothing else to come after that. And that's exactly uh, what happens here. This describes this moment to a T. Let's look at letter B. God works everything for the good for Moses' parents. And that's what faith does. It moves mountains. It changes circumstances. It rearranges the creation, if need be, so that you can walk on water. You can raise the dead. You can heal the sick. You can change the water into wine. Whatever you need, God can do because God is almighty. Amen? So the first thing that had to happen was that Pharaoh's daughter shows up and she wants to know what's in this basket. She has to notice the basket. She has to hear that crying. Hey, go get that basket. I want to see what's inside that basket. And the second thing is, don't miss this point, it says that she felt sorry for the baby. She had compassion for this child. She could have said, man, I love this basket. Throw the baby in the Nile. I'm going to take this home. You know what I'm saying? It could have been just that simple, but she sees the baby. And because she was there, not back at home, you know, she immediately was drawn towards, connected with this baby. She has compassion. And I imagine too, that Pharaoh's daughter may have been barren. If she didn't have children of her own, she might not have been connected to this child. But she sees it. She has compassion for this child that's there. And there's nobody else, I believe, except Pharaoh's daughter who was able to do what she did and defy the king's edict. All right, let's go to uh, verse 7. So it says, Then... His sister, Miriam, asks Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? What a great idea. Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Now just let that sink in for a second. Here comes Miriam. She's getting closer and closer to the group as they're opening up the basket. And they're looking at the baby. And they're all, you know how girls are. They all ooh and all over the baby. And everybody's, and Miriam says, hey, do you want me to go find a, a Hebrew woman to come and nurse the baby for you? Hey, great idea. Go find one and come on back. Now, I want to tell you. From the moment uh, Pharaoh's daughter tells her that, and she starts running as fast as she can to get back to her mother and tell her this incredible news. It tells us in Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Don't you love to bring good news? Don't you love to receive good news? I mean, if she could have had an out-of-body experience, I think she would have. She can't believe what just happened. Not only is Moses rescued, now her mother is going to be able to nurse this child. She comes running into the house. I'm sure the Jochebed was just absolutely the worst moment of her life, just crying and sobbing. And she's saying, Mom, you're not going to believe what just happened. Get up. We need to go back. Pharaoh's daughter wants you to nurse the baby. I don't even think she had registered with her. It must have been the most surreal experience in her life. And she came back. And let me tell you, this is one of my favorite verses in this passage. It's verse 9. It says that Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Amen? Hey, give God a clap offering. I will pay you to take care of this child. So the woman took the baby and nursed him for her. 
How in the world could things turn around so quickly, so miraculously, so incredibly, so perfectly, because that is the God that we serve. She's now, she doesn't have to hide him anymore in the, uh, in the darkness. She doesn't have to scurry around in secrecy. Now she can take the baby openly. She's getting paid. She probably had to go to the palace every day. Hey, I want to see the baby around two or three and, you know, bond with him and everything else. And this baby is just getting uh, blessed with all kinds of stuff. The best that Egypt had for this baby Moses. It's one of the most incredible things when you think about it. Now, the bottom line is that the devil can't win and we can't lose if we stay in the center of God's will. Amen? Do you believe that? We cannot lose and the devil cannot win. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him and he delivers them. So it doesn't matter how black it is around you. As a matter of fact, sometimes God wants to get it a little darker so the glory will be even greater and he is going to deliver you in your situation. Amen? So one last thought here. Uh, Carlos, we're going to get ready and close. One event can change everything in your life. Think about that. It just took one event to change this whole story around when Pharaoh's daughter decided to go bathe at that precise place, at that precise time, at that precise moment, that day, it changed the whole course of history. One event can change everything in your life. One event can change uh, change Aram's and Jacob uh, Jacobed's life. One event, it changed Laura and Ken's life. That one event began to change the future of Israel to this day. One event, it can change your life. One event can change the course of this church's history. It only takes one event from God to change everything. It can change our nation. It can change our world because we serve the way maker. Amen. God is the way maker in our life. But we must walk by faith and not fear. We won't be able, if we walk by faith and not by fear, we won't be able to sink. Stand on the conviction of God's word. Amen. Hey, let's go ahead and stand together. And I'll close with Romans 8, 28. That God can make all...